Hi and welcome to Off the Hill, the ANU's weekly look at what's been happening in the 2016 federal election campaign. As always, I'm joined by my colleagues, Dr. Ryan Goss, constitutional law expert, and Dr. Andrew Hughes, political marketing expert. If you've missed any previous episodes and you want to catch up, just go to the website at anu.edu.au. If you find yourself in Canberra on Tuesday evening, you can get along to our policy forum, The Vote. This week we're talking about health policy. Again, details are on the website. Now we're halfway through the election campaign, so we're going to take the chance to really take stock of where we are and, and talk about what's been happening so far. And, I mean, really, in a lot of ways, not much has been happening. In another way, it's all been happening. The polls are at 50 yep. all. This should, be, this should be going gangbusters. You know, yeah. this is, it's on, right? Yeah, it's it on is. like Donkey Kong. It is. Um, yep. Pre-polling starts this week. We know that up to a third of, of all voters might vote before election day, which is huge. Uh, a lot of those are commuting workers, so people who you know end up in the city on uh, their lunch break, decide to go and vote. Not a very deliberate kind of act, but they're just there. Uh, and people like us who work at universities, who work at schools, who are going on school holidays, and, and students, students, mm. who I assume is all that is watching us, <laughs> are, um, have want to vote beforehand. This has huge ramifications for the campaign. Um, before we sort of talk too much about that, what's going on with the polling, Andrew? Yeah, look, you know, you get the sense that Bill Shorten should be a lot happier and a lot more confident in what, how he talks about um, policies and how he should be acting. Because look where he's come from. Political you know, graveyard where people were writing him off six months ago, no chance at all of winning the election. And now look where the polls are and look where his personal approval ratings are as well. He looks happy enough. You think so? I don't think he looks happy he's enough. He's having Come a on. great time. He I think he's I th not. I think, I think at this stage, you know, Bill Shorten looks like he's having a great time. Malcolm Turnbull is... He's sort of uh, grinding this one out. Yeah, he so. seems that way, doesn't he? I agree about that. Yeah, Malcolm Turnbull seems like he's not, not having a very good time at all. Is it the jogging that does it? <laughs> I tell you, it, it, Shorten it looks be. fit. He, looks he really does, doesn't fit. he? Yeah. yeah. And he and look, and he's got that momentum behind him a bit too. Look, and but I just sense when he does the big policy announcements like the other day about um, the economic policy, he just mm. didn't seem like he was had that passion you'd feel of a leader who feels like they're about to win an election. Now, so, I, I think one of the reasons probably we're not seeing, you know, giddy heights of excitement <laughs> from either leader or, or, you know, on the other way, the, the sort of pits of depression yeah. is because, you know, nationally we're 50-50, but that's not the main game, right? Yeah, that's yeah. right. And I think that's what we're going to see. That's going to be the interesting story over mm. the next three or four weeks is that we have national polls that mm. are, as we say, about 50-50. But if you look at the state-by-state -state polls, there's wild variations. Mm. The coalition is so far ahead in Queensland, so far behind in Victoria. Um, very different pictures. And no and one knows what's happening in South Australia. No one knows what's happening <laughs> in South Australia. And that's before we even look at the marginal seats mm. in Queensland on New yeah. South Wales, right? So the national mm. polls are going to be what get the, gets the headlines for yep. the most part, but they're not necessarily telling the full story, are they? It's all happening below the surface. Mm. Yeah. Also would assume. Yeah, exactly. And and as Ryan said, the marginals where the action is at the moment. Um, you look at a seat like, for example, Krangamite, I hear is not budging at all, um, even mm. though there's been a lot of visits there by both sides. Um, it's still quite solid to the coalition at this stage. They need to pick up a good swing in that seat to win. And it's a seat like that across the country where they have to really pick up um, Labor to win this election. We're starting to see some preference deals in, in outer suburban seats. The I think shady the, deals are the happening. Greens, I don't think they're shady so much. It's a democracy shady in action, Shady backroom Andrew. deals, come on. But the Greens <laughs> have said, you know, they're going to leave uh, open tickets in some of these outer suburban Melbourne seats. Yeah. Uh, Barnaby Joyce is... Um, uh, how do I say, I don't want to say throwing money, but uh, announcing projects, announcing big capital expenditure in, uh, in New England, up in his seat. Um, we're starting to see some of these things that we would expect to see in a normal campaign. Yeah, and that, this is a segmentation approach. Now you do the national campaign, but you have to still worry about the local seats and you have to do the segment quite well. You have to mm. think, okay, this seat here, what are the real important issues where I can throw money at and put the um, promises into a tangible form? I know you, you don't like this talk. You want to call I know them consumers you don't like now, don't you? <laughs> they are. They're Come voters, on. Andrew, Come on. they're people. <laughs> uh, they are. They're not science experiments either, Jill. <laughs> oh, it's <laughs> touche. Well, let's, let's think about those promises that Andrew mentions, because I think one of the interesting things we're seeing with all the, the pre-poll voting, mm. right, so many people are going to be voting weeks or days before the election, yeah. is that they'll be voting potentially before some policies are announced, or before some promises yeah. are announced, so they won't have the full picture. They won't be fully aware of what's going on. So that's a really weird dynamic that Australian politics is still getting its head around. It's something yeah. we haven't quite faced yet. And I think the major parties are really struggling to come to terms with what this means for election timing. This is why we've mm. seen such a slow mm. burn, right? But yeah. this week, pre-polling starts. So we're going to see people start heading to the booth. 
Yeah, not it's, the normal crazy, booth as we it? know it, but an, a, an early booth. Yeah. Uh, and I think this week what we've seen is, um, and a part of this is really because of the, the terrible fact of this East Coast low that we've had, storms battering up and down the East Coast, loss of life, uh, incredibly traumatic series of events. Yep. I would have expected to see a bit of a pivot from the leaders at this point you know, getting into campaign mode, getting out there, where are your waiters, you know, you're lugging sandbags to help. We saw this with Rod, you know, we've seen this before. Why aren't the, the leaders doing this? We don't have an answer for it, I think. Well, is your suspicion, Jill, that they, um, that the leaders don't want to look like they're capitalising on a, on a crisis or capitalising on a tragedy? I is think that... there's absolutely that. And I think mm. there's also the sense that we don't know them particularly well yet. And yeah. we don't sort of have the trust in them that they would be doing this, uh, <laughs> without being, without seeming disingenuous. And these yeah. are, you know, these are two of the, um, relatively speaking, less experienced leaders yeah. to take major political parties to elections in Australia for, for some time. Yeah. And um, <coughs> we're, so we're seeing them do things which we haven't always seen in Australian mm. politics. This week, Malcolm mm. Turnbull released, released the autobiographical film about his childhood as a, in a single parent household and his, his life before he... Uh, he made his millions in his various careers and really emphasizing to the Australian people that he's where he's come from but also that now he's as he is fond of saying he's a, he's a grandfather he's been married to Lucy for a long time and trying to personalize and reintroduce himself to the Australian uh, I was the main object of everything he wanted to achieve he was very focused on doing what was right for me on 7 30 uh, last night Malcolm Turnbull said that Women can do everything, and so can grandmothers. <laughs> and I thought it was an admirable effort to shoehorn his grandparent status into every possible <laughs> conversation. He must be impossible to talk to at the moment. Uh, Childcare policy. We've seen the we've seen the flip side of this this week. Shorten mm. having a human moment, where um, where, I th where he said, and I defend him uh, to the ends of the earth on this. But he did say, when taken out of context, this sounds terrible. Let's face it, men in Australia rely on the women in Australia to do the childcare and to organise the childcare. Now, as a woman in Australia, I, I cheer him. I say thank you for, for acknowledging, you know, all, all the unpaid and, and undervalued work that I do. But it hasn't played well for him. No, not at all. And, and, and look, I think maybe it's because we're in the middle of a campaign and, mm. and the cynics out there are seeing this as, as, you know, basically, oh, this is Bill trying to connect with people, engage with people, but what a way to say it and have it come out. And it can, it's a campaign, it's going to be misconstrued. People are dissected on social media and it sounds absolutely appalling. But he did follow it, it up with, I understand how difficult it is for a, walk, a working woman with the kids trying to work out how on earth does she go to work if 80% of what she's earning gets eaten up in childcare fees. This is an incredibly legitimate yep. and pressing yep. and important issue. And childcare is a massive issue. I mean, for some people anyway, I'm, me personally, Big issue, massive, sensitive, you know, wedge mm. for sure. You, mm. You're there on me on, on childcare because <laughs> I go through that. Whoa. Yeah, I'm I know. Bad. Can you tell? <laughs> can you tell? Can you guys tell? Um, but it's it's like that because, you know, you're paying so much money for, for childcare. It's the price of an elite private school. And you're thinking, where does this money go? Why am I paying so much money for? Why can't they have worked out a policy? And Ryan and I were talking about this earlier about uh, maybe a policy where, for example, why can't you put a childcare centre next to a school on government land and have it nationalised across the country? National standards for the sector <laughs> once anyway. There you go. It's my policy. We're not going to nationalise childcare. <laughs> but I, I think I can say with all confidence that funding for childcare is only going to get up. No one's going to pull money from adorable babies. Well, and I think it's, if anything, it's a surprise that it's not more of an issue, I think. I think, I think for um, Generation X, increasing Generation Y, um, things like childcare and housing affordability are only just beginning to be talked about in politics to the same extent that they're yeah. talked about around the barbecue and around the Well, and those, the yeah. younger generations, like some of us in the room, I'm, I'm not casting aspersions <laughs> here, uh, do, we do swing more from, from party to party than other, than but, other but older voters. But is it on childcare? Would, would childcare influence your vote? At the end of the day. My kid's in school. <laughs> final thoughts for the week, Ryan? Uh, well, my, my final thought is that we are, um, we're filming this on a university campus in we a are. capital city mm. and um, on another university campus in a capital city not too far from here in Port Moresby, students are protesting and um, putting themselves in danger um, in order to express certain democratic rights. And as we go through an election campaign, um, it's worth remembering that that this is happening in our, one of our very close neighbours. There are bigger things happening than this campaign. That's and right. our thoughts are very much with, I think, our colleagues in, in PNG right. at the moment. Yeah, for sure, 100%.
Andrew? Um, just to change tack a bit, um, I think I'll look at the advertising front this week. We noticed a change finally in the coalition's messaging strategy. First time this week we've seen um, a negative ad being used by them across the airwaves. So I think it's a sign of perhaps we're now getting to that final part of the campaign proper itself. They've switched finally to being negative. Um, hats off to Labor as well, who only this week did a multicultural campaign of mm. most of their campaign ads. Great work. I mean, it, I really admire them for doing that too. Um, again, the cynics out there all say it's a ploy. Um, to me, personally, it should have happened elections ago. Yeah, and it's sign of things to come. Yep, so in Arabic, Hindi. Hindi, um, and uh, I forget the other languages involved. Ch Chinese, traditional and mainland. So yep. um, it's got to just pick up and yeah. I think the elections are really important. Yeah. Now, I think mine's a bit of a downer too. I think we're going to see insurance claims start to uh, roll in this week from the affected areas, the storm hit areas on the East Coast. And I'm fascinated to see how that plays out as a political issue. Yeah. So until next week, we'll see you then.